Uh, I think the the one thing I want to focus on today is what might work. Um, uh, I must admit, the I had a rally, you know, that the Nasdaq could rally to Nasdaq 100 could rally around. 7950 to 8200 that was kind of my limit we're above that now um it's it's been a great rally i think the one thing that i would it, it feels to me uh very similar to when we were actually running up in late february where tesla was going parabolic and we had all of these stocks surging and it just seemed to be this endless parade of names going higher and these parabolic breakouts and and everybody's having the fear of missing out, and then it only, it rolled over right after that. So I'm I'm starting to get very sensitive to that feeling of uh, fear of missing out and jumping in right at the end. Uh, it's hard not to because the market keeps going up three percent a day or whatever. So uh, with those kind of moves, that that is just so um, strong. Now I do want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Looks like it's changing on the panel here, so we'll see if that works. Uh, let me just shrink this down. Okay. And so um, if you're trying to find my work, it was just on that previous slide, and then the contact information for me, you can reach out at newupdate at gregschnell.com. And um, uh, Dwight Galusha has helped build a website for me, gregschnell.ca, moving my stuff over there. So uh, we'll be pointing over the gregschnell.com to it right away here. Okay, and uh, so what I want to cover off today is just a look at the short term. Barry did cover off most of the things I want to cover off. I'll add a few little uh, tidbits. Commodities have not started to rally much yet, but I think if this is going to turn, and let's just say China leads us out, I think you want to lean heavily into the commodities, lots of them. So for Apple or for Amazon to double, it would go from $2,000 to $4,000. That is very possible. I, I mean, they hired 175,000 workers in March and April. That that number is just phenomenal. So great stocks can do that. But, you know, we have a lot of the Canadian oil names that only need to go from $1 to $2 to double. Um, they're just so beaten down and so ugly. Same thing with some of the marijuana names. Um, some of the precious metal names have already had big runs. Uh, so we want to just, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then uh, follow that up with, if it doesn't work out, where do we go from here? And I, you know, I have trouble believing that we're going to have a backdrop as bad as the the Great Recession, uh, 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 the Great Depression back in in the 20s and 30s and not have a bigger price move down than we've already had. Um, in 2000, we made a high in March. We pulled all the way down and then by the time September came, we came all the way back up and retested that high. And so that is one of the scenarios that's starting to go through my mind. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of scenarios that that uh, we have to keep sort of working towards because the, let me just go get a chart. Uh, dollar SPX. And, and the, Again, I'm not trying to say that this is going to be uh, 2000 or or uh, or a Great Depression or anything like that. The point I want to make is it, because the Fed has flooded so much money into the system, this could easily go all the way back up to the highs, no doubt about it. Um, on here, here is the point, I just didn't quite get enough of this. Um, here's the point I want to make. So the stock market made a high in March, and this is the S&P 500, and it pulled back quite hard, but kept finding support at the 200 day, and then retested the high um, a little bit later on in July, and then again in September. Didn't quite take it out, as you can see based on the numbers here and then started to fall away, and then the 200 was kind of the limits all the way down. So if we just uh, take that simple map and just move over to the end now, um, where is the 200 day? And so the 200 day is just sitting up here at 3,000. So maybe we get all the way back up there. It would surprise me that we go straight up there, um, but 
that doesn't mean it's, it, it won't work. The one thing, notice the volume in the last two days has been very light, um, hasn't been anywhere near the aggression showing up uh, both ways. Now, there was one particular sector that really took off, um, and that was technology on the basis of things could open up very quickly. and and the the difficulty we're going to have obviously is the um, the effects of the economy or the effects of the stock market and i think jim kramer pointed that out that you know a lot of the large cap companies are going to have enough money to get through this so they may not actually need to be so deeply depressed as say the small caps where the the small caps are are the ones that are going to get hit the hardest and probably don't have the streams of cash flow and the borrowing lines and all that kind of stuff to get through. So uh, try to keep an open mind as as hard as that is. Um, I, I'm struggling with it too to find the stock market continuing to rally day after day and and we all know that the reversal will be vicious if it comes again. So we need to watch it, but. The, these really low volume, the last two days, that's probably telling me that um, things aren't settling down. Uh, we're just rallying on very soft volume. And we did this, maybe I can show you this. At the end of February, you'll notice we really started to have a big drop in volume as we got to the market tops, and then all of a sudden the volume started to take off again. Uh, so just uh, a little bit of caution on the volume and a little bit of caution on the price action. If we go look at the NASDAQ, I, the one thing I want to point out is see this thrust here. So this is the NASDAQ advanced decline line. So again, the difference between the number of advancers and the number of decliners, and you get a value. What the cumulative advanced decline, so this is this is what it looks like when it's not cumulative. This is the individual reading. So yesterday was a down day, we had a pull down, today was an up day. And even though it was an up day, we didn't have a lot of stocks advancing, not nearly as many as we did let's say, uh, most of last week. What this spike up here does is it takes the two-week moving average. So just trying to level out the day-to-day -day swings and say, how does it look? Well, in the 2018-2019 low, the surge we got off of that was massive, and we got up to this very high level, and then we stayed up there for multiple months, and up here is the, the actual um, NASDAQ composite, and you can see we ran up for quite a while. This high level, we we experience that very few times. So if I just um, make this, whatever, 17 or 18 years of history, what you see is the level we got up to here, call it over 600, is very, very, very rare. Rare air indeed. And so it, what it doesn't do is it doesn't normalize for the for the different numbers of stock market or different number of stocks on the exchange at any given time. This is just taking the raw data. So it, it just says we've got a, a very fiery spark and we saw one of those coming off the 2016 lows. It was pretty big, the 2018 lows. And the one thing I will show you is the computer algorithms that are doing the trading now. Like this use, this was the 2016 low and we fired all the way up to the highs. This was the 2018 lows, and we fired all the way up to the highs. So we went lower and went higher. Here we went lower, and now we're going higher. So each one of these rhythms are getting bigger and bigger. The swings are getting bigger, and the computers are pushing it both, uh, stretching it both ways. We have options expiration coming up on Friday. Uh, so far, the last two dates were exactly that. They were options expiration Fridays. I'll just grab that chart quickly. So on this particular chart, you'll notice that the market topped right on this options expiration day and bottomed the day after this options expiration day. So with that, uh, we have one of those coming on Friday. Is that another turning point for us? And it wouldn't surprise me that it does. And why is that? It's because everybody gets to reset their positions. And if they think the market's run so far now, they're they're actually going to take option positions going the other way where the market will drop. I don't know if that's going to happen, but to me it seems very lined up for that sort of event. Uh, Barry did a good job of covering off the rest of the breadth. I I could spend a whole hour just on breadth and talk about all of the remarkable levels that have been hit. Um, this is the McClellan oscillator, 
and it surged down to this minus 30 level, which we've reached three times in the last 20 years. That was the 08 crisis, the 09 um, March low down here in 2010 and 2011, and now now. So the these are remarkable levels. Now we're bouncing back up in the summation index has gone from very low shoots back up and, and we're getting up towards um, just getting back to zero. In, in bear markets, it will wobble down in here. Like in 2008, it was up here, pulled down, and then it stayed down here for a while before it actually finally got back up above zero for any length of time. So it looks pretty promising with this big rally we've had. I would just say all of the indicators have gone to such extremes in this 2008 swing, what we saw here was um, we were still in the midst of this downturn. Um, so the October low, we pulled down into a November low, rallied up to January a little after the first, and then fell all the way into the March 9 low. So it's not easy after we get through this. Um, there's a lot of rough um, water. And I would encourage you to use 60 minute charts because a chart that moves so much in one day is what you used to be hoping for in a year and a week. Uh, so as an example, the two day swing from Tuesday to Wednesday of last week was equivalent to all of the gains from the breakout in October to the top in February. So massive swings in a day compared to uh, the, the overall market setup. setup. So uh, you're going to charts right now, they're really way too slow. I mean, by the time the PPO turns on a weekly chart, you're, you're uh, 30 points away, 30% away. Um, Barry pointed out this PPO trend line on the S&P 500. This is a 60-minute chart. And I would just say if that starts to, to vibrate down below this level and, and maybe break below zero, that would make me more cautious. I would definitely be worried about that. It can, it can dip like it did here in early part of April, just below it, but we do not want to see it start tumbling down, 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 down again. That would tell me that the whole thing is starting to um, reset up. Okay, let's talk about the gold stocks briefly. Uh, so what we have here, this is intraday. If I go to make a one week rate of change and I'm just going to go pick the, the stocks that change the most and then I'm going to pick the SCTR ranking, just suggesting that those are um, higher price stocks and also probably a little bit more important. Um, so 20% changes in two days, 30% uh, changes these are absolutely massive moves. And so as much as I like the gold trade, it wouldn't surprise me that we pause here a little bit. When you're getting 20% a week, that's not how the market kind of starts a rational move higher. And again, this is almost one month later from the actual lows of March 23rd, where I guess we're still a week from that one month number. But when you look at these weekly charts, this is you know, the, the low was back here on March the 16th. It was a $32 stock. We're at 62. This is a 100% move in two weeks of a very strong stock. Um, so I, as much as I like the gold, to me, this, this probably tells me exactly what I need to know. The momentum was here, less, and now we have a doji candle, similar to the same sort of climb we had up in here, and I would be cautious as this pulls back. So this is a daily chart just with a couple of different indicators. Down here is a MACD, and I've just got longer time cycles on it. So this is my PPO, which would have a normal MACD 12, 26, and 9. And then I put some longer time periods on here just to slow down my MACD and get a bigger picture. But you can see this is clearly a thrust that's quite extraordinary um, in the last six months. So that tells me that we're a little bit stretched, too, when we're making these hallucinogenic moves to new highs, if that's if that's fair. Um, and then this one is a really long period, like a 600 uh, number. It's really long, but you get the idea. It's been bullish all through here. Uh, the correction got down, and now we're starting to run back up again. But without question, this, this really does look like a, a blow-off top or something like that. 
Obviously, every person who believes in gold thinks I'm way wrong and we have lots more to go and I'm okay with that. Trade trade what you'd like to trade. Um, I'm just suggesting that when you get these 20% moves in a week, um, this is GLD here and, and we've got the doji candle there. This is quite a thrust. And then if we go to GDX, which I think is just hiding a little bit farther down here. Can't see it, so I'll just type it. Um, so on, on GDX, uh, again, a, another doji as we tested the prior high. Exceptional speed, lots going on there. And if the overall S&P was going to roll over, this is a place I'd probably expect the gold stocks to start to wane. So, uh, and maybe I, I've got one more chart here as I leave gold. Actually, I'm going to go back and do it over here. On this one particular chart, um, I compared gold to uh, to the S&P. It is in here somewhere. GLD. And go with that one. No. Um, what I did was I, I put the gold chart above the S&P and, and just had the two. So maybe I could quickly spend a minute and just create that chart for us. I'm just going to go to my main indicator, my main default chart. And then I'm going to go add the S&P underneath it. And I'm going to get rid of some of these others. But the reason I want to show you this is because through this whole period, um, this might actually wipe out the one I put in there. Um, yeah. Okay, we got one, but I put it above. That's okay. Let's make the height the same. And then I want to make them both line charts, and there's a reason for this. Just makes it a little cleaner, and I also want to shorten the time frame, just to be the last few, say, six months or something like that. Um, even just 01 would be enough. 2020. Okay. And and the point I want to make on this particular chart is that. Um, when, when the S&P first started to fall, gold was running up, S&P was running up. The, the S&P fell, gold fell. S&P stopped falling, gold stopped falling and rallied hard. S&P rolled over, gold took a few more days to roll over. This is a 60 minute or daily chart. And, and as we're falling, they fall. Gold starts to rally before the S&P starts to rally. They rally up, S&P's falling, gold's falling, they rally up. They do move similarly. I agree they don't turn on the same day, but it's a very close correlation in my opinion, close enough to be, at least be aware of it, um, that if the S&P weakens, you might just see the same thing happen in gold. Now, I, I know there's a lot of gold bulls out there who think gold's going to the moon, and I would just say keep your stops tight and let it run, and if it runs and you get another 50%, I am thrilled. Uh, keep doing that. Uh, just just be aware of the of the hyperbolic or the parabolic nature of the gold curve so far and and try to make sure you're trading within yourselves so that's the the backdrop on gold and don't get me wrong i think you want to be long gold um, on the next pullback i think it'll be another great place to be it's just when you get this much thrust right now i, I would pause it so the, the chart list I'm going to show you now, we're going to work through briefly, and it, it's one of the, the areas that I think is absolutely um, wiped out. Nobody has given it any um, cred all the way from the, from the prime minister to uh, the world. Uh, nobody wants an oil company to get bailed out. Nobody wants anything to happen on that side of it. I think they interviewed uh, a thousand people in the U.S. and said, you know, which company should get bailed out, cruise lines and hotels, and, and they had oil companies on the list. And I think it was less than 30% said the oil companies should get any money. So it's quite a, for an industry we all use every day, it's quite a hated nation. Um, 
the the perspective that I would add for the Canadian energy sector, just that was different than the U.S. energy sector, is it's been in a recession for four years already. Now we're thrown into the second recession, or or continuation, but wave two, and and on that whole setup, these these names are so beaten down and so depressed. Uh, it, it's really a substantial time to be aware of how far they are. And then the second component to that is, if if you look around the world for gold, every ounce of gold that has ever been found is still here. If you look around the world for oil, it loses 5%, uh, all the reservoirs decline by roughly 5% a year. If you just took the global average, it's about 5%. So if we stop drilling totally in in a period of time, we would end up having um, no no oil in the ground and no oil uh, being being used. the The big thing that happened on the oil chart, and that's probably a fair thing to go get, is uh, in 2008, oil made a significant high, and the reason I want to sh- I want to talk specifically to that high is I want to talk about the long-term commodity cycle. And what one of the things that happened in in the long term, I'm just going to clear off all these other indicators to make that chart a little higher. One of the things that happened in in the studies of commodity historically was done by a guy named Kondratiev. And what he mentioned was that there's these big 30 year up thrusts in, in, um, in the economy. And then a seven, he said 34 up and 17 down. And he was a Russian uh, mathematician scientist. And he, he got sentenced to go up to Siberia because uh, the, the current czar didn't like him uh, kind of telling people how bad it was going to be. So we are sitting here with a high in 2008, and we are now in 2020. It's been at least 12 years. So it doesn't mean that we're at the end, but it, just if you, if you, what it says is you overbuild everything. And then as the whole thing unwinds, you get down to this low. And I, I realize so many people think that you know, we, we can get by without oil. Well, it's very difficult to make steel without oil. It's very difficult to make, to refine copper without oil. It's very difficult. You know, all of the things you hold in your phone are, are usually um, melted with oil. So, so those components, either coal or steel, sorry, coal or oil are used to make all that stuff. And about I, I think the numbers I heard were was worldwide about 25% of consumption is is transit or or vehicles moving around. So with if you just remove that if you just said okay we wiped out 25% and literally by slowing down the world that seems to be a pretty good number we've taken down from um, 105 million barrels a day, and it looks like we're going to come in around 70. So we still have a few vehicles moving, and we have a whole bunch of factories that are shut in. So that that's probably a, a good number. Anyway, with that, we've got roughly a 70 million barrel a day base, and above that, you need to grow. So we're we're sitting here, and since 2008, no real mega projects have been approved. So in Canada, we were lucky enough to have mega projects on the way as this big slide hit, and it took until 2010, 2011 for those mega projects to finish up. Now these mega projects are huge. Um, a, a new car plant in Ontario is four to five billion dollars. The the pipeline going to the west coast for the uh, to get him at that project with the pipeline, the infrastructure and everything is a forty billion dollar project. That's eight car plants. It is so big, and these projects are so long. So it's unfortunate that none of these were allowed to kind of get going while while we had some economic activity because now we don't have those to carry us through anymore. the The bottom line is that's happened worldwide. And so with that, what we end up having is this decline in production 
a decline in production, a decline in production. But the big mega projects aren't really going on in terms of drilling for oil. So we don't have big projects at the oil sands going on. We don't have big projects in Brazil going on. We don't have big projects going on in Russia or in China or in Australia. So of the few um, major projects that were still going, like I think ExxonMobil had one for 750,000 barrels a day, but the way they kind of do it is they do 150,000 barrel chunks at a time and keep working up, and that's what was supposed to happen in the oil sands. Um, so with these big projects kind of swinging higher, we're, we're going to get to a point where we have too little oil um, being produced, and we have no mega projects to kind of bring that much oil on again. So the swing, and it might be in the next two to three years, but the the opportunity is going to set up probably on this major low that that we actually get to a point where the worst has been priced in. Like we're going to have uh, Western Canada crudes floating at a you know under four dollars a barrel. I think today was the close, or maybe it was four fifty. But at one point today it was under under four dollars. With that very low price, it shuts in oil everywhere. And that's fine. So we're going to we're gonna have this low, and I'm not saying for a minute that tomorrow is the day to buy this. But what I am saying is be very aware of how major the opportunity will be for a very deep, deep, deep low. And if you can buy some of the major producers, especially in Canada, because we do have a pipeline that's supposed to come on, which is line three, um, that goes to Minnesota, and when that, um, I don't know if I said that well enough for for Ellen, but Minnesota, um, it's going to go through Minnesota, and when it gets to Minnesota, we'll double the output for for Canadian oil and gas from 375,000 to 750,000 barrels a day. That is a pretty substantial number. In the last three to four years, there's been a whole bunch of small initiatives, 30,000 barrels here, 40,000 barrels here, a little tweaking on this, a little uh, pump adaptation somewhere else. And so all of those changes and, and rail car movements have added three or 400,000 barrels. And then if, if either Trans Mountain or Keystone ever gets built, uh, that would add another million. When if one of those two happens, and if we can start to get some oil moving out of here, we will have the opportunity, first of all, to get the narrow between Western Canada Select currently trading at one-fifth of what West Texas crude is trading at. Um, so that would close, first of all. And then the second layer would be that all of these mega projects have been stalled. We've had this big 15-year downtrend in commodities. And as we start to come out of that commodity downtrend, the opportunity to the upside will be quite long, especially for the first uh, four or five years. And I know a lot of people think we're going to go to solar and we're going to go to wind, and we will. But the main, um, even if you go to copper, you're like to to electrical, you're still going to need to refine. Um, the copper, you need to get it out of the ground, you need to dig that, that's remote, that means oil and gas to power vehicles to get the copper out of the ground. Once you get the copper, then you need coal to melt it or smelt it, and then you use all that to build out the electrical grid. So one of the numbers that I've been given is that if the city of Vancouver gets 10% of the cars on electricity, it will wipe out the grid in Vancouver. They physically will not have the power capacity to handle any more than a 10% electric car load. Even if I'm wrong, even if it's 20%, the power, the price for power that we're paying currently is going to spike significantly. And for that reason, I think you'll find natural gas comes back on stream to help carry that load until the power plants get built, either solar or wind or wave or any of those alternatives. And, and that whole picture, just the macro picture that's setting up here sometime in the next one to two to three years with this major, major base will be one of the most delicious places to get on board to find, you know, $5 oil companies and $2 oil companies and 50 cent oil companies that are 10 and 15 and $20, much like the gold companies have been running for a while now. So it, I just want to, 
set up the backdrop because it's so profound that we're getting this opportunity and so with this opportunity i think one of the big things that we we're sitting here looking at is this massive base and and uh, there's a lot of great oil companies here that can do a really nice job on it so i want to make sure that everybody understands the upside opportunity the potential and the fact that the companies are well positioned even globally to to uh, get this thing going wait as that is the backdrop just understand the opportunity for this major, major low to be sitting here in front of us. And, and for that reason, um, it, it will be whippy. I, I have no doubt about it. It'll be difficult to try and get. But if we just take this, I can even move this up as a different kind of higher trend like that and perhaps do it here as well. If you take that general trend, whatever, we're at the bottom, we're near the bottom, I expect at least a bounce on some of these stocks of 50 to 100 percent. Um, Vermilion Energy's already moved up 200 percent off the lows of just two weeks ago. Uh, these are huge, huge swings and you, you know, when you can find that on a 60-minute chart, that is just so powerful. So again, Amazon, it's going to have to go from two thousand to four thousand dollars. These stocks have to go from two bucks to six bucks, and and it's um, and again they were ten uh, just two months ago. So I think the opportunity is definitely there, and I want to try and make sure that everybody understands the the window of opportunity in front of us. And as much as uh, the world is changing and we'll end up with, I'll call it less oil consumption generally, uh, there's still a lot of initiative needed and, and we're still going to have to find a millennial who wants a, a copper mine. And if it takes the the Trans Mountain Pipeline's first AFE was 17 years ago. It was October 2003 was the first time they applied for capital four companies ago. Um, it was BC Gas at the time, and they were trying to build this out. And, and so 17 years to get a pipeline done. If it's going to take 17 years to get copper mines, we won't be moving to electric cars at anywhere near the rate we need to get there. Uh, to clean up the environment. So uh, just try and, and keep the whole thing in context, but I think one of the opportunities is definitely um, going to show up in the whole energy space. And again, that's just big, broad picture uh, backdrop. Now let's go look at the, some of the stocks, and I don't want to pause too long on each one because I could talk excited for a day about this, but um, I, I do want to show... Um, I'm going to start right at the top here. These are 60-minute charts, and, and the reason I want to show them on a 60-minute chart, what I've done is uh, I have a what's called a Keltner channel, and I've set it up as a very narrow channel. And what you do is when it's below it, you just avoid it, and when it's above it, you ride it, and then when it starts to go below again, you want to get rid of it. Um, the again, this was 250. It went to five bucks. This was 100% on Arc Resources in a few, you know, three weeks or whatever. Even if you didn't pick it up on the first low, you got it on the second low, or you got it on the third low. It's been a run from 350 to five dollars. It was, you know, a, a 30, 40% run. So these are really nice setups. Now, uh, I've drawn them on a on a 60 minute chart with about two months of data, so you can see the drop and the bounce. But most of these, like if, if we just step out of this briefly and go look at this on a five-year chart, you know, this this was a $20 company. It's, it's five bucks now, so it's down 75%, and that's after it's already bounced 100%. So th these are really extraordinary situations here. And again, if they can get through the financial um, downgrade and actually get oil to market, it will be one of the most significant opportunities um, to make some money. But I think if you waited until the pipeline is actually built, most of that that first phase of of Western Canada select crude getting up near 
it, it'll never get to the same as West Texas crude because there will always be a pipeline differential cost, maybe a dollar, a dollar and a half a barrel, but it would get us a lot closer. And, it, and, and that West Texas price or the Brent price, the global price of crude oil, if we could get oil so the Line 3 gets it to uh, the Great Lakes so it could go out to Chicago, New York Harbor, Toronto, Montreal, Detroit, whatever. It could go to any one of those refineries. Um, if we can push it out to the West Coast, then it can go to Asia. So there's there's lots of different things. And originally, the whole oil sands was set up. Shell was going to have 500,000 barrels a day in oil sands uh, project. It was going to have a pipeline go straight down to, to uh, Galveston, Texas, uh, to the, I think it's the Port Arthur refinery there. And essentially, they would be able to know that they had safe, secure supply for 50 to 100 years at that refinery that would come out of there. And then if if that pipeline ever failed, they could just bring in a cruise ship or a crude oil tanker and offload that and, and handle that crude on a short term until they got the pipeline up and running. When we build the pipeline or the, the refinery in the middle of nowhere, like Edmonton or whatever, we, we don't have a... Uh, a backup. We don't have a way to bring in a crude oil tanker to, to help them out. So those things are real um, situational and that was the whole goal. So if we can get some of these pipelines going, that will really help stabilize the Canadian oil market and should really help this investment structure. So again, a lot of these companies have had these big downtrends. Let's just go look at, at um, some of the companies here. I'm going to start it on a new page again. Okay. So let's go to view all. And so this is Arc Resources, and again, five bucks down from seven in February. Still, here's Birchcliff Energy. It was 50 cents, went to a dollar ten. Like these are real companies, even though the prices are only at a dollar. Um, it, it's just been unbelievable how slow the economy has gotten. So here's the PPO trend line, and it's already broken. I want to see that come back, and I don't know if it makes a lower, lower, a higher, lower, whatever, but sometime over the next month, month and a half, I'm thinking this is kind of the opportunity that is setting up. So we just want to kind of watch and let this sit down, give us a second low, um, and on that second low is probably the best place to start to think about getting long. So here's Bonterra Energy, and again, you see the same sort of thing. This was 75 cents to a buck 50 in a couple of days, really. I mean, from the 30th of the month to April 5th, this thing went from, you know, just being flat in here for two weeks at 80 cents to a buck 75. It's that kind of horsepower, and again, Amazon has to go from, you know, 2,000 to 4,000 to get that same sort of return. Now, uh, Obviously, there's not the liquidity for everybody to do that, but there is for most of the people on this call uh, the volume that they'd like to trade. So uh, here we look at Bonavista, I mean, $0.05 cents and $0.15. Cents. This is amazing. Um, I would say if you wanted to, you can go check Joseph Schachter's work on BNN and Eric Nuttall's work on BNN and get a list of the companies that have hedged better than other companies. Um, some of these companies have their crude hedged at $60 for the rest of the year, um, and their names just got thrown out. Uh, Baytex is one of those companies. So this is a $0.30 cent stock. It got up as high as $0.45 or $0.40, cents. and this company is owned by the uh, Alberta Teachers um, investment arm. It's owned, like, it's got real stuff going on behind it, and yet it's trading at, at just pennies. It was a buck fifty in February. It went to 20 some cents. Um, these are just remarkable levels. So, again, it wouldn't take much to get doubles on a lot of these names. Cardinal Energy um, from 25 to 50 cents. Uh, Canicol, you know, this one is a, I think it's in Colombia they operate. The chart doesn't move fast enough for me um, as much as I'd like to be happy about it. Here, cne.to. What you just see is the chart's flat. It hasn't done anything for years, and even through all this volatility. So I've got it on my list of things to watch, but it just never seems to break out. So it's one of the reasons that that might not be one I would pick. Canadian Natural Resources used to do about 650,000 barrels. It does 1.3 million barrels. It's now Canada's largest oil company. And 
uh, you know, the stock was $40. It's at 17. It was $40 in February. Um, again, if we got any sort of West Texas uh, price, the, the price for Alberta crude tightening up towards West Texas, this stock could easily go $40, $60, $80. You're in the largest oil company in Canada. They've got financing and they have world-class assets. They do a good job. There's lots of um, you know, if you're looking for something more stable than some of the junior names that are at 15 cents, I get it. Um, who would imagine they would have got to 15 cents? But these are, you know, Suncor and CNQ are real companies, really great companies that do a great job. And I think, um, you know, waiting for them to just come up and pull down here, that's the, the price action we want. And I just want to go show you, um, and I own none of these today. I'm waiting for the pullback. Uh, so, uh, as these charts, see how this MAC or the PPO is way down here at, at the lows. What I would like is some sort of a long, slow grind. I don't think we're going to get that. I think we're going to get some sort of a hill on a 60-minute chart or on a, a a daily chart, something like we got back here in 2016, where we had the big pull down and then we made a higher low. And even this low, this was a worthy trade. This was $20 to $28, and then it fell from 28 to 18. I mean, these are just massive moves, 40% in a couple of weeks, uh, six or eight weeks, and then all of a sudden it takes off from $18 and gets to $40 over the next year on a relatively smooth ride. So that's the kind of trade we're looking for, is a doubling in some of Canada's largest oil companies. Like, it, it really is... Um, the opportunity is sitting there for us. So just try to keep your eyes on these. Uh, again, this looks so pinched in, but it's just because the chart used to be $40 and, and got squeezed. Crew Energy, this was 15 cents to 22, um, more of a natural gas play. Here's Synovus. Synovus has had, I'll call it, struggling with management for many, many years. Um, and, and they finally have some much better management. But when you look at the weekly chart here, this thing was hovering at around 20 bucks. Then it shifted down to 15 bucks. Well, then it shifted two, um, you know, and jumped to four. So this was a double. Uh, again, it could double to get to eight and double again on your, your $4 bet to 12. So a 200% increase to get to where it was in February. Um, real companies with 600,000 barrels a day with, um, when the price is high enough, they can use a, a train to deliver it to their refinery in the U.S. So these are really exciting opportunities. Okay, um, Interflex uh, just working its way sideways. These guys build um, equipment for the oil patch. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage you to look there. Look at this Enbridge pipeline wedge. This has been building for a month. Uh, they're the ones who own line three, the pipe that's supposed to finish by December. Um, if that could start to turn up here, again, it was a $56 stock, it's 40. And I realize the whole world has stocks on sale. I'm just saying, you know, these things have big opportunities to the upside. First of all, um, if, if Enbridge can get this pipeline finished, then all of a sudden, uh, two big things happen. One is uh, they're going to move a lot more oil. So they were moving 375,000 barrels. Now they'd move 750,000 barrels. So they get the revenue off of that whole increase in stream. And then the whole oil patch gets light shed on it because all of a sudden they've got new oil moving, prices are tightening, and this whole thing lifts. So this is one of the charts to stay very aware of what's going to happen. Enter plus. I drew this black line here just to show you, you know, when this PPO trend ends, it's a nice place to be aware of. Uh, all of a sudden it rolls over. Now, I don't know if it's going to go to 275 or 250 or 225 or $2 or a buck. I just know that the momentum has come out of it. It's broken the kind of month long trend we had going here. Let's watch and see where these oil stocks settle out. But we still have way too much oil on the market. We have way too much oil in storage, and everything is under pressure. So as they come down, um, commodities, you've got to buy them near the low and sell them near the high. You don't. This isn't Apple where you get to hold it for 10 years. This is a, a trade where you make 100% or 200% and move along. Gibson Energy, uh, really uh, new CEO a couple of years ago, but this company's well set up. They have a whole bunch of things that they've got going on at the terminals that would be at the hubs for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the, the pipeline to Keystone XL, as well as um, the 
line three that I just talked about. So they're well positioned for storage and a company like Suncor will say, can you put a million barrels of storage there for us and, and manage that? And so that's what they would do. Uh, really an interesting company and well run. Husky Energy rolling over. Uh, not as keen on this one. Um, it, it's okay, but again, it's it's just one of the others. If you're looking for a company that also has uh, a refinery that they sell their own, they produce the oil, they put it through the refinery and sell it. Um, it's a relatively small setup, but it still works. High Arctic Energy Services, these guys uh, make the oils, the, the camps for people to live in, um, up in in some of the production locations. Obviously, this isn't one of my favorites now that we've had this big uh, pullback. I actually thought things were going to start to work out, but um, I would wait. This Kelt Exploration, very exciting company, really well run, was 75 cents, went to a buck 40 or whatever, so 100%. Again, these are all just in weeks and then a pullback here. As long as these companies can make it through to the other side, um, that's the, the big opportunity. So I'd, I'd encourage you to go and look on on BNN at Eric Nuttall's work and and Joseph Schachter's work for the whole background on who's got hedges in place and that kind of thing. It'll help. Um, Shel Sheldon Schumer, I think is his name. Um, Schulich, uh, he, he owns 5% of Meg Energy, really big investor in commodities in Canada for many, many years. He's got his name on a lot of the universities across Canada. Um, you know, a buck to two to t over 350. I mean, this was a 200% move, and it's pulled back a big part of that. Even at 250, it's a steal. It was 750 up here. Just uh, well, obviously, when crude oil was a little bit higher. Um, so uh, it's 200% to get back to February. If you've got any sort of patience at all, um, pretty nice. Mullen Trucking has a huge trucking company. It's 16 different truck lines. They run everything from oil patch stuff, heavy equipment, to regular freight, refrigerated, dry, whatever. Um, this company's just been taken out to the woodshed. It, it was one of the better run trucking companies in Canada and just... Um, has really been beaten down. So this thing was seventeen dollars at the top in 2017, and is you know four and a half now. Is there going to be freight moving in Canada again? Yes, but you can just see this was a ten dollar to four dollar move um, on the back of the Alberta economy slowing down again. Precision drilling, the drillers. It's going to be a while. First of all, spring breakup is here so until roughly I'll pick the end of May um, the ground is too soft for them to move rigs around the good news is there's no rigs rolling so that doesn't matter but when they start to perk back up again again they're in the US they're in Canada this stock has been basing for a month you'll notice no bounce whatsoever just let it sit here but when it starts to break out that'll be one to to try and take a ride on okay Continuing on, Pembina Pipeline, again, same sort of, you see this on the on all the pipeline stocks. They're kind of building these big wedges. If they can start to move to the upside, that would be helpful. Uh, Questor, they make technology that helps in the oil patch. Um, they actually have scrubbers to clean the air, and so they're expected to sell their technology uh, throughout the U.S., but they were 550 here in February, and all of a sudden with no oil sands invest or oil company investment, it drops to a buck. Uh, the great technology, Canadian company, really good. Um, Shaw Core, they, they make the insulation on the outside of the pipes. Again, just beaten down from ten dollars to two. Can you believe this stuff? So anyway, when things finally get rolling, there's just some massive one, two, three hundred percent opportunities if you have any kind of patience at all. We just have to make sure they have the cash to get through to the other side. Uh, secure energy services, again, same sort of thing as a driller, like precision surge energy, same thing, just kind of sitting sideways, nothing really going on. Kind of want to notice the ones that actually got a bump here, because I think they're also the ones that will make the next wave up a little bit faster than most. Uh, Suncor Energy, you know, this was a beautiful move um, off the the lows of $14 up to $24. That's a 80% gain or something. Very, very quick sliding in at this $22. You'll notice it looks a lot like the CNQ chart. 
and I think they're all kind of you can just how narrow the range is trading. There's nobody really trying to sell it anymore. Um, the base is kind of being built. So if you can uh, stomach some downside volatility as crude settles out down here, this might pull back. I don't know if it gets all the way to 14 or 18, but that's what we're looking for is just can it get any sort of downward thrust? And if that happens, I think you want to be a buyer on those for a, for a long time. Trican Well, same thing, another driller, oil service company, just in this very tight range, you'll notice it had no bounce. That That's the same for all the service companies. Turbida, same thing. Torque oil and gas, nice move here from, call it 30 cents to a buck. That's at least a triple, um, maybe even a uh, 400. Yeah, if you had 30 cents in it, it might have been a yeah, buck 20. So crazy, good. Again, just let these things come down. They're real companies, believe it or not. Um, Tourmaline, this one is well-financed. I mean, the, the president of this company is probably one of the richest people in Western Canada. Um, so anyway, it's been a big push off $7. It's up to 10 If it gets any sort of sneeze down to $9, that's probably uh, an attractive place to look. And then I've got just a few more on this next page, and then we're going to skip over to something um, in the marijuana area and then uh, wrap it up there. Here's Trans Canada Pipe. This one again is the Keystone XL going south, and they're going to try and get the portion finished across the border, um, so it's not an international debate anymore, and get that portion done. And then they just have to really finish the leg through Nebraska, which will, um, which apparently they have most of the approvals for, or all of the approvals for. So with that, um, again, that's three years out, and that's the one the Alberta government just invested in. 47 to 67, I mean, it's still up 50% on a pipeline. That's amazing. But uh, if we get any sort of another meltdown in the price of oil, just try and come in and look at these names when they're really destitute, and uh, you'll probably find some value. Tamarack Valley, again, it didn't really get a bounce, so I'd probably leave it. Vermilion, this one was uh, $2, went all the way up to 7 so 250% gain, and it's been relatively smooth. You can see the ride is, is uh, you know, we're looking at a 60-minute chart, and this thing's up 200%, so really dramatic moves. That would be Amazon at 6,000. So, and I get it, Amazon's got cash flow, and Amazon's got this and that. Um, I'm just saying there's some real opportunities here for Canadian investors to make some good money coming off of these big lows. White Cap is another name I really like. Uh, well-run company, well-respected, probably in a top 10 junior sort of category. Um, up 75 to a buck 50, so it went up 100%. How many charts did I just go through that we could say they went up 50, 80, 100% in a month? And I think, you know, if we go look at Magna or some of the big uh, names in Canada, they're they're going to have movement of 20 30 percent i just don't think you're going to get the lift so i would encourage you to try and hunt out in this area uh, I, I think there's a real opportunity here i don't know if this whole little squeeze here ends up breaking to the upside or actually if we get another uh, deep lake lower it'll probably depend on what the overall market does in the next few days okay so hopefully that was helpful if anybody's got any questions throw them in the chat box and we'll try and answer them uh, towards the end um, marijuana, it's an ugly, ugly area, and the charts are beaten up. I, I have a list that's huge. We're not going to cover the bottom half of the list. We're, we're going to look at the first 20 or 30 names here, and there's one chart down here at the 28th name, uh, Valens, and they're actually on the TSX or on the venture, and they're going to the TSX, I think, on the 16th, so today's the 14th, so on Thursday. Um, and they just did their press release after um, after market close. The numbers seemed okay. Um, I, I'm, I don't ever get involved in the financials. As soon as I do, I, I end up holding the company regardless of what the chart says. I'm much better to just trade the price action. But this is one of the few charts that still has an uptrend. So I'm going to leave that till we get to the end. And we're going to jump into some of these other names right now and just work our way through them. And the reason I want you to think about them, and again, I think these are some of the opportunities. Um, they've been beaten down for a year and a half, not just for a month. And I think they're, you know, when, when they come out the other side, we could be pretty good here. Um, so these are in the order of, of scooter ranking or volume, one of the two. And 
the the reason I want to show them to you is just because there are starting to be some improvements on the chart. So this was a big downtrend in momentum. It's actually making higher lows right here. This is Corbis Pharmaceuticals trades around six bucks. Um, interesting to look at. I'm not a big pharmaceuticals trader, but you know, this is just starting to get above its 10 week and 40 week. And if it could start to turn up here, this is exactly what you want to see. Higher highs on on momentum, lower lows on price. So as price comes down, the momentum is improving on the second low. This is kind of textbook stuff. So to start with, that's a pretty good backdrop. It's up 4% on the week. And let's go into view all mode. Okay, um, Scott, and, and don't get me wrong, there's still opportunities in the banks and all that. I just don't think the 100 percenters are going to be in the banks and in the, um, the you know, maybe it'll be in in Linamar and some of those companies, but I don't know if the big ones like Magna and stuff are going to be the, the places where we can get that kind of thrust. Uh, Scott's Fertilizer, this is traded on the U.S. side. It's already back to kind of where it was before the big breakdown. When, when this momentum starts to change here, that would be important for me. I, it's not my number one call, and it's a $100 stock, so I would just stay away. This is the marijuana inverse ETF, and you can still see it's got a big pronounced uptrend. In other words, marijuana names are terrible. <laughs> um, my, my big point was when that starts to break, that's also going to just be something to, to keep your eye on it when that chart finally starts to roll over. So it's HMJI, hand me a joint. Um, HMMJ was always hand me my joint, um, was the way it came out on TV one day. And I have never forgot that. It makes it easy to remember. But um, anyway, this uptrend here is quite uh, pronounced. And obviously, if it starts to break down, that's the change we're looking for across the whole industry. And they'll start to improve. Um, this is an industrial property company that was leasing space out. Um, so they would kind of handle the building risk for these um, medical marijuana names. And now what we'd be looking for is, can it start to research? This isn't my favorite just because the industry seems overbuilt with too much capacity already. So I would just watch it, but that might be a clue that things are starting to be imp improving just if we start to see that. This is one of the bigger ones out of the US, uh, GWPH Pharmaceuticals, big downtrend here, trading at around 100 bucks. It hasn't really picked up like the, the one I showed you previously, uh, Corvus or something like that. This thing's still drifting lower. It's this trend in momentum here. And again, this is almost a year long. When this starts to break out, that's a really nice place. And we saw it back in uh, 2015, 16, it was plummeting with all of the rest of the commodities. And then all of a sudden, bing, popped to the top and ran up for quite a while. Um, there's there's better charts than this one. So this one isn't um, isn't the one I kind of want to highlight. It's just that it's definitely sitting on the end of its downtrend and perhaps it could start to break out to the upside. Neptune, look at this nice move on on uh, this afternoon. So uh, almost a year long downtrend from July of last year to April of this year, nine months. And starting to push to the upside here, really nice push. Scooter ranking jumping above 30 for the first time in six or eight months, so that's good. And when you get the big thrusts, like down in here, they were obviously just kind of happening every now and then, suck you in and throw you out. Um, but when it finally changed um, into a big long uptrend, there was you know some real money to be made in here. I don't know anything about them. I just know that the chart shape is starting to do what I want to do. I want to see a break in the relative strength downtrend. Scooter ranking starting to improve against the rest of Canadian stocks. Price action moving above the 10 week and breaking the downward trend line. And my PPO long term momentum here on a weekly chart, if this starts to break out to the upside, you know, I would own the trade and, and put my stop, you know, kind of right under where I bought it. Afria, same thing, a uh, big long downtrend going on for almost two years. And the momentum trend broke here. Price didn't really do much and then it rolled right back over. So whenever these big long trends break, you still it's not like they're free money, but um, you, you'll see it on so many charts. Um, I'll just show you an example on something totally different just so we can see what happened. Here's TRI, um, Thomson Reuters, and you see this momentum trend here for like a year and a half, and all of a sudden it breaks. And then it was this beautiful run, 
and and it helps if if the whole industry starts to move but in this particular case you know who would have taken a sleepy company like Thomson Reuters hadn't done anything for years and then all of a sudden double the price from 50 to 100 bucks so it's that kind of thing we're looking for out of these marijuana names so that's why I'm um, and again, I, I wasn't in them on the whole first move. Um, I traveled across the border too much. I was too worried about what might happen to me if I if I was um, invested in them. So I just stayed away from them for the first ride. Now that they're all kind of beaten down, it's normalized, um, I'm much more interested in these. And if they can start to move, that would make me a little bit happier. Here's Canopy Corp. And this is one of the big names that I think needs to be considered. And there's a whole bunch of reasons here. So first of all, we have this uh, downtrend that's been going on, still going on, no doubt about it. What I like is this PPO that had a two-year time frame on it. See how the width from here to here is almost a year long, really long. And now it looks like it's making a much shorter turn and might possibly start to get back above this trend. One of the things we see in a lot of these trend changes is just that. I don't know if that if uh, that Thomson Reuters chart had it. Let's just go look. Um, so you have this big long downtrend and it starts to thrust up. This was still quite a while, six months maybe. Um, but you start to see a, a shorter time frame and then all of a sudden they start to turn higher. I see it on quite a few of the charts. Um, Anyway, that one, I'm really excited. I want to see this one kind of the PPO get above minus 10 here. That would probably put the stock above its 10-week moving average. And again, if the whole group can start to lift out of here because they're all showing the similar setup, that would give me some encouragement. I don't think there's a need to rush. I think it's a, a situation to watch. And if the overall price of the markets roll over, you'll probably find this is sucked down again too. Um, but if it, if it holds in here, um, I think the top five or ten names are going to start to pop out of this industry. So here's uh, Cardiol Therapeutics. That looks like a downtrend to me. You know, it breaks the little trend on the daily. That's not enough for me in something that's in this big a downtrend. I really want something more um, long-term really starting to change like that canopy, canopy growth one. Here's Kronos Group. Um, they broke their downtrend. Now, the good news is they're not going lower anymore. They're going sideways, and so we could start to draw higher trend lines across momentum. But momentum usually improves before price and or with price, it, usually before. But if it's just with price, at least it's something to watch. So here you have an uptrend in momentum, it breaks, and that's pretty much where you want it out. And then you've been downtrending for a long time, it, it, I'll say it broke the trend, but never really got any sort of turn, upturn. And now it's just going sideways. So momentum isn't getting worse. It's stabilizing. And if it was to, to start to pick up, it would give us something to look at. Okay. Um, again, we're not going through all 80 charts here. We're only going to go to the second and third page. So don't, don't get too uh, <laughs> concerned. I won't drag you through 80 charts. But I will show you this uh, downtrend on the hand me my joint um, life sciences ETF. Uh, I joke with that. Hopefully that's okay with everybody online. But it's just funny. Um, it was an easy way to remember the ticker symbol. Anyway, downtrending line here for a year and a half. Look at this long trend in momentum. It actually topped in 2018 before Weed Wednesday, which was October 17th, 2018. And so you've got this big, long trend line in red. Well, that one's pretty long. You also have one trend line down here in black that's at least a year. And you've got that same thing where you've got much, obviously, canopy is a heavy weight in here. But you see the same thing where a big, long one and now a little short one. And it looks like it wants to start to turn up. Uh, back here, there was a big, long one then a little short one and it started to turn up and, and that wasn't a bad buy signal right in there. Um, so we're, we're starting to set up right here. And again, it might only get back up to this red line and roll over again. I just don't know. But I would say that, you know, when you get these big long setups, especially multi-year ones and they start to break, they can be very, very um, influential. Um, and Amazon's just doing that right now, by the way. So it's a nice breakout on Amazon, not to, I love Amazon. It's a beautiful chart. I would just say um, I'm trying to show some opportunity, bigger opportunity. Um, so here's 
Pyxis International, again, this was a big name, IPO'd, came out, did the super surge, $52, it's a buck. Um, just unbelievably beaten down, lots of money lost in this all the way down. You've got a downtrend here in momentum. It doesn't look to me like it could get fixed until way over here in April, May, June, later on. But if it started to turn up, maybe that's something to look at. Again, it was a $50 stock. Um, click, this one's just kind of weak. I, I don't really like anything about it. Um, I'm going to stay away from it. Organogram is one of the lower cost producers, apparently. Um, they reported earnings today and it was pretty rough. They were down 13%. Um, so they pr produced, they had lower revenues overall, lower profits for sure. Um, they'd laid off staff, blah, blah, blah. So a uh, big downtrend there. Again, same thing. The momentum downtrend is broken, but it hasn't really started to turn up yet. So if all of these names start to move across the 10-week moving average together, that's probably going to be part of the clue. I would expect the leadership names like Canopy, um, Aurora, all of those, Organogram to, to start turning up Kronos, and then you just have to pick the ones you want to ride uh, for the trip. And I think, again, from $2 to $4 wouldn't be too much. That was January. So Charlotte's Web holding straight down here, same thing, year-long trend line on momentum. If that's going to start to break out to the upside, that would be helpful. Um, Aurora Cannabis, just straight down. Same thing, big, long downtrend here. When all when the selling is done and the momentum finally improves on these names, and, you know, edibles was supposed to be the big thing, that didn't really work. Uh, so really, these names are in horrific shape. It, it didn't help that Ontario um, closed them and now probably realizing they've just pushed everybody back to the black market. Maybe they'll reopen them. Um, I saw Bruce Linton on on uh, BNN suggesting that they're starting to recognize that that was a mistake. Anyway, um, it's just an idea to of a place to um, you know, stay focused because there are things changing in the industry and uh, Ontario didn't build as many stores. So as it starts to improve, I think there is hope here for some of these beaten down sectors. Um, canopy growth, again, this is the US side, but you just see that long trend line now that you've looked at a few charts with me. When that trend starts to break, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and getting back above zero, you can see when it was in its big uptrend, it was always above zero on the weekly chart. When it started to go below zero, what happened? Yeah, it was pretty ugly. So uh, we we never want to be invested in weekly charts pointed down. We want to be in weekly charts pointed up. And if they're up below zero, watch with caution. If they're up above zero, that's kind of the really bullish part of the ride and, and one you want to try and stay on as much as possible. Truly Canopy, since it ipo uh, Weed Wednesday pretty much um, two weeks before it 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 has done nothing since uh, just gently wound down here but price is still holding up around $13 so again same thing momentum trend is still down and out I don't know what they do but um, this is the U US um, cannabis ETF and you can just see still not above my Keltner channel nothing here to really like if it started to surge above it that would be worthwhile but um, Green Thumb Industries, this just looks beaten down. I don't think I want to own it. And, okay, just jumping into the last few here. Here's Tilray. Obviously, this one was $300 all the way down to 6 bucks and 3 bucks. That's a bit of a 99 percenter. Anyway, we're down in the bottom corner, bottom right-hand corner of the chart. Um, you know, momentum is starting to flatten out here. This whole downtrend in momentum would have to break for me, or I'd at least like four months of, of momentum trend on a weekly chart to start to, to slow down. It's just not enough for this to kind of give me a quick kick up here. I would have very little faith in it. I want the big momentum trend to start to change, especially on something down 99%. Cure Leaf Holdings just keeps dripping lower. Um, Again, downtrend and momentum. Can it start to turn up here? Got that big wide down sweep, and now perhaps that little shorter one that starts to focus us in. Um, FSD Pharma, I don't know. There's nothing really there for me. They've done a one for 20 split or one for 200 split or something on their stock uh, a while back here. Um, 
Cresco Labs, again, all of these have the same sort of downward shape, but a few of them are starting to improve in my mind. Um, here's Afria, uh, US side, and trying to get above the 10 week for the first time since, you know, back in January, maybe something there. PPO is starting to turn up that year and a half long trend line. It would be nice to see that start to break. And here's Terra Corp, big downtrend for over a year. Same thing on its momentum indicator. And look at this, just starting to tweak up here, very close to breaking out above its trend line. Might be something there, and the 10-week is right there as well. So all of a sudden, you're above the 50-day moving average or the 10-week. Um, start to get a push, but there's been no volume really showing up while it's trying to stabilize. So either no sellers or no buyers, one of the two. Uh, been very, very quiet, but if you start to see something push around here, that's the kind of thing we want to watch for is this long trend in momentum, a year and a half, all of a sudden starting to improve, and now we want to see the price action start to take off. Again, it wouldn't take much to go from 250 to 5 bucks. And Valens, we're going to finish on this one for the sole reason that it's the only chart that we looked at in, in 28 of them that has an uptrend. And wouldn't that be nice to actually buy something uptrending uh, after looking at all these ugly charts? So for the last six months, no question, it's been just jogging sideways. Uh, $4 down to $2, pretty ugly hammer here, um, coming down quite hard. Again, this big long gap, and you're still... Uh, waiting for this to start to turn again. They reported earnings yesterday. I don't, I don't focus on earnings. I wait to see what the market thinks about the earnings. That's more important for me. But you can see that it was down here below zero before, and then had a big up thrust. Uh, I know very little about this company other than it's in an uptrend. So I'll leave all of the rest of the homework to you. Okay, so with that, I tried to blast through a few different ideas and hopefully um, show you some that might have a heartbeat there. Uh, let me just see if I can figure out how to get the question panel back and just see if there's any questions or if, um, if Barry, you want to jump on the line if you can see the questions. Well, let me see if there's two in the chat box. Yeah. So okay, yeah, think... any questions? So, guys, post it. I think it's the chat window if anyone open them up. Yeah, so there's one. Can you, can okay. you see that, Greg? You like energy as a possibility. Yeah, I can see it. You like energy as a possibility. How about the ETF XEG? Suncor and CNQ make up 56% of the CNQ. XEG and then another seven or so stocks make up another 30%. Without question, it's a nice, smooth way to play. You take out the single stock risk up and we can go there um, when that chart starts to turn up that's going to be a better sign for the whole industry um, uh, the reason I covered it off on the 60 minute charts is just because you know the, these things moved so far uh, again in one month it was the it was a one two hundred percent moves on a lot of those charts so here we are uh, sitting down here again if it can consolidate I wouldn't actually mind if it comes down and t tries to test this $3 level again, 350 somewhere in here, and you start to get momentum improving. But I'd watch it on a shorter time frame to see if it can start to, to get a little aggressive. Um, a lot of people are asking, uh, some of the questions I get a lot are, okay, Greg, the banks have pulled back. I really want to own the banks. And I, I don't want to discourage anybody from owning a Canadian bank. I think they're, you know, they're safe and all that kind of stuff. But my bigger issue is you're sitting here and, and this, here's the Royal Bank at, call it $88. Its high was 109, so it's got a 20% lift in it. Um, you know, your your ET, your yield here is 4.75%. So not really enough to make it worth, um, like it's nice, it's great yield, safe company, all that kind of stuff. And if you're a yield collector, um, this is a good place to look. I would just, um, it, if we're talking about capital gains, I would just focus on, on something a little more um, aggressive. And the one thing about the ETFs, when you take the middle of the road, you're going to get the average move. And there's nothing wrong with average if you're comfortable with the less, um, oh, with a smoother return, might not be as aggressive. 
Yeah, and, and somebody just said, what do you think of putting a small amount into 10 or so of the ones you think are the best? A few should excel, some perform above average, and some will fail. I, I, I would just say that is exactly the approach. Don't put all your eggs in CNQ or whatever. Like if, whatever, if you had 10 grand you were going to spend, I would do um, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, or 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, whatever, some sort of, scale across them and some are really going to surprise you like I think everybody I know is surprised that the best performing asset off the lows was Vermillion. Um, I don't know how many people have said that but it's it's a lot. Um, anyway very smooth right out of the hole and so I, I wouldn't pick one name I would try to pick a group of stocks. Um, I, I've I've waxed on forever about C and Q and their ability to buy uh, Shell's assets for half price and they bought the Devon assets at, at a reasonable price whereas Synovus I thought they gave um, they paid way too much um, and I happen to be a shareholder when they did it um, so somebody just said Greg can you post a list of that and I'd be happy to so let me just get there and what we've got is a summary page and I'm going to put them up here. Um, there's a few more down below. Let's just see from High Arctic. There's another seven names. So if I shrunk the screen one, maybe, let's just see if that works. Um, does that get us all? Okay. So we're going to leave out uh, Yangara resources, but that gets you the whole group there. And if you just take a screenshot, um, that that should be able to get it and you can also go to the recording on the CSTA website and they'd be thrilled if you went in there and searched out the data again I think these names are in a downtrend I still think they're in a downtrend but if uh, I'm not going to get to talk to you on the day they turn so my hope for you is that you're watching them very closely and again don't put all your eggs in a falling uh, you know a, a falling knife but we want to wait for a little bit of a, a lower, maybe a lower low in price, but definitely a higher low in momentum. And on that, especially on the 60-minute charts or on the daily charts, that's going to give us some sort of an opportunity to start to step in there. And I, I just think that there's a lot of runway out the other side. Okay. Um, Agri-commodities. Uh, U.S. farmers are plowing food under corn, wheat, soybeans. Do you play futures or stocks? I do not play futures, um, so I do everything through stocks. I'm watching the agriculture's hard. Um, Archer Daniels, Midland, Nutrien, Mosaic, all of those. But one of the problems we're going to see in the whole um, egg space is the biggest single user of nitrogen is corn growers and corn growers um, originally got a big bump in the price of corn because they started to use it as ethanol for 10% of the, the gasoline in cars. The issue is with the oil price so low that makes the ethanol too cheap and they can't make any money in it so they're not going to grow well, and apparently there's a whole bunch of corn being planted uh, this year. And the real question would be, I'm not sure why, because it's not going to be for ethanol, because I, I don't see the price of oil getting up meaningfully into the 40s or 50s until even if it was the end of the year. Um, again, you're looking to try and build a base in some of these companies, and if if it takes a few months for them to move up, um, you know that that's kind of what you want to get on these lows uh, I will say sometimes it'll take the oil stocks three four five months they'll track behind an overall turn in the economy and then say I think it was in July they started to kick up I, I should go back and look before I say that but I thought it was roughly July in 09 that the energy name started to accelerate after the main low on the indexes was in in May and I'm hoping for the same sort of thing here where we get a a secondary low in the energy names and then from there because they can move way faster than tech stocks when they when all of a sudden the thing starts to turn so that's what we'd like to want yes uh, Luis said 60 minutes shows farmer plowing cornfields under thousands of acres and and that's the problem so I um, so I don't know that uh, nutrient is going to be the stock to own this year I'm starting to like the price action on the industrial metals if China was going to start to improve there's some opportunities there um, whatever first quantum and Hud Bay and Lundin and all of that gang um, 
Lithium Americas, LAC. Uh, there's there's a whole perspective there, and I really like the whole idea of the copper electrification of cities and and building out the grid and all that kind of stuff. They're going to have to figure out some place to get a power supply. And if it's solar or wind, they're going to have to build transmission lines. That's going to take 10 years because you can't get a line approved anywhere. Um, it's a bit like trying to build a pipeline. And then uh, on top of that, you got to get somebody who signs off and says they want a copper mine. And everybody goes, no, I don't want a copper mine, but I want to own a Tesla. Well, Tesla's got six times more copper in it than any other car. So um, all that copper's got to come from somewhere. And so until we start getting copper mines going, and guess what? At low prices, nobody's building them, nobody's approving them, nobody's um, getting them ready to go. So that's a whole hurdle. So um, I know in Ontario, a lot of people are focused on how high the prices of electricity are. Well, if you think they're high now, wait till you put a whole bunch of electric cars on the road and don't have a power supply, uh, a power plant to build more power. Um, it's, it's really going to change um, the price of power. So I, I see a whole bunch of fits and starts trying to get going, but I want to pick up copper names on the lows here. I want to pick up industrial metal names on the lows. I want to pick up oil names on the lows. All of those seem very, very, very um, attractive for if, if you've got any kind of time horizon, uh, you know, oil back at 40 or $50 instead of $4. Um, you can just imagine the kind of returns. So, um, I know I've run on a little bit here. We're already at 7.15, uh, my time, 9 o'clock to everybody else. But I just I want to give you the, the shot of encouragement as depressing as living through this big down cycle in the market is. There's a huge opportunity on the upside, but you have to stay on the charts. You have to be on there for 60-minute chart times, um, like a time frame daily at minimum and then when you start to see the whole industry put them all in a group together when they all start to turn up catch the ride and make sure you get an opportunity so thanks everybody for joining me um barry i'll turn it back to you um yeah thanks greg uh i'm sure everyone appreciates uh all your charts and information uh, great presentation i think uh from a from a perspective i think we're done for today so thanks everyone for joining us um, we'll again meet again next, uh, next month, third Tuesday. So everyone stay safe and thanks for joining us today. Bye bye. Yeah.